How's everybody doing today? Awesome. I understand there's probably a few more people that are braving the horrific storms that are plaguing Southern California, and so we pray for them to get here safely uh, despite the challenges. Well, we like to start our services every week by saying welcome to any of you that are joining us here in our sanctuary for the first time, or if you're joining us online, welcome. We're so glad you're here to worship with us today. Today, we are beginning a brand new series, a brand new book at the very beginning of the Bible. We're going to be studying for some time, uh, I don't know how long, um, the book of beginnings, the book whose very name, Genesis, means the origin, the start or point at which something comes into being. You know, the Hebrews uh, named or titled this book Bereshith. And that word in the Hebrew language simply means in the beginning. And then as time went on in the Old Testament, it was translated into Greek around 250 B.C. They translated that Hebrew word into the Greek equivalent, which is Genesis. And then as time went on again, both the Latin and English Bibles simply adopted that title for this book, letter for letter. And this title, Genesis, is an absolutely perfect title for this book because this book of the Bible gives us the Genesis. It gives us the beginning and the origin of so much. It teaches us the beginnings and where we get our doctrine of God, our doctrine of man, the doctrine of creation, the doctrine of salvation. This book talks about the origin of the universe, the origin of sin, It defines things like marriage, human government, and it really gives us the beginning of the nation of Israel. And everything true that we know about all of these things has its beginning in Genesis. And really, the rest of the entire Bible, all the way through to the book of Revelation, stands on what this very important book teaches us. Now, the Bible as a whole you should understand, looks uh, in both directions into eternity. In Genesis 1-1, we're going to read today that it says, in the beginning, God. And we see that in the beginning of the Bible, it looks into eternity past and teaches us some very, very important things. And then as we just got done studying as a church, the book of Revelation, we see that we get the look into eternity future where we saw the new heaven in the new earth, in the new Jerusalem in Revelation chapter 21. But it's important to understand that regardless of where we're at in the Bible, the entire thing, the main subject of the whole thing, front to back, is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is who the Bible is about. Your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He has his prophetic genesis here in the opening chapters of this book, and then everything after Everything through the Old Testament, as we'll be studying over time, leads up to the first coming of Jesus Christ. And then after we get through the Gospels, which tell the story of his life and his death and his resurrection, the rest of the New Testament then all leads up to his second coming that we learned about in the book of Revelation. But the foundation of understanding all of it, the foundation of understanding every detail of what the Bible has to teach us about ourselves, about who he is, it all has its beginning in the beginning. And that's what we're going to be studying today. But first, we're going to spend time worshiping God, who is our creator, the one who existed before all things, the one in whom all things had its beginning, our Lord and Savior, God Almighty, our creator, the one who loves us dearly and loves us more than anything else. We're so excited to worship him. And so we're going to do that as a body together before we study the word today. But let's pray. Father, we love you so much. God, we're so grateful that you sent your son to die for us. And Lord, as we're even going to see in the very first verse of your word, we see this mystery of the Trinity, this mystery of the Godhead, Lord, that you are one unified holy God, yet you exist in three distinct persons with different personalities and different ministries. And Lord, we know it is a mystery to us, Lord. Our human brains cannot understand all of what that means, Lord. 
But God, all of what that means is that you created us, you love us, you knew our needs, and you died for us. You rose from the dead and then gave us eternal life through our faith in you, Lord. God, all of it starts in the beginning here, and I pray, God, that you would speak to us, Lord, and bless us as we study your word, starting here in Genesis, God, that you would speak to us about all the truths and the wonderful things that you have about who you are and who we are, sin and salvation and all of it, Lord, that we would draw closer to you as your people, that, God, as we draw closer to you, we would become more like you, and that through us, Lord, your glory would shine to those that don't, know, don't yet know you, Lord, that they would come to salvation as well. But God, we want to worship you and praise your name because you are holy. You are God Almighty. You are the God who always was, always is, and always will be. And we bless your holy name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship. Praise the Lord. Are you ready to greet the Savior and praise this morning? Amen. Let's all stand. to Jesus who has risen from the grave. He is our God and we are his people and we are called into his house to worship him and him alone, to offer up our praise to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to hold nothing back. And so we do. And what a joy it is to be with you this morning, to do just that, to lift it all to Jesus. 
All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. Amen. Praise the Lord. Please be seated. Again, welcome. What a joy it is to be gathered together in the name of Christ, to worship him, and to give thanks in all things. And as we enter into this time of thanksgiving and giving in the household of God, I would ask our, our uh, offering team, if they would come down to the front. And again, as we uh, started last week, I think it was last week, <laughs> doesn't matter, as we started recently, um, the, offer, the opportunity of having our offering team walk through the aisles to receive any offering that you might have, it's just that. It's the opportunity. We're well aware that um, God puts it on our hearts to, to just give in the household of God. And that can be done online, it can be done through our app, it can be done Sunday, it can be done Tuesday or Friday. It doesn't matter. The point is, is that as we learned in uh, Pastor Nathan's gratitude study series, that we are to be as Christ is, and there is nobody who is more giving than our Lord. He has given us everything. He's given us this new life that we have. The new life that we celebrated last week through baptism. Gosh, how many opportunities are there to give thanks to the Lord, amen, for all the things that he's done. And more than anything, that is what this moment in worship is all about. It's about putting everything else aside. And it's about lifting up your heart and your hands and your voice to the Lord. To hold absolutely nothing back and give it all to the Lord our God for he is worthy. That includes the, the resources that he's given us. We trust him. So pray with me. God, we thank you that you have provided new life to us. You have provided the spirit of God to us. You have provided your word to us. How can we not cry out, thank you, God. Thank you for today. Thank you. Thank you that you are in this place. Thank you that you walk with me daily. Lord God, according to your word, we want to hold on to nothing. We want to, to offer up our offerings to you in recognition of who you are, in recognition of, of our obedience to your word, in an act of worship to you. So God, receive what we have. Multiply it for your glory. And we ask, God, that you would continue to bless us, that we might be poured out more and more on people in this world, that they would see Jesus in everything we do and say. And as we walk faithfully in you, they would see you in that. Thank you, Lord, your God. Let us be your people holy and completely this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Oh, he is our judge and our defender. Sing with me. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. He sent it into darkness. You rose in glorious life. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in
believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Oh, I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus, I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we believe you are Lord of all, King of kings. You are God Almighty, and you have bought and purchased us. By your blood, we have been saved, redeemed, washed clean by the gift of your very life, taking on our sin and shame. We have been made whole to walk in new life in Christ. Lord God, thank you. Use us. Fill us with your word. Fill us with your spirit this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Please be seated. Irene. Good morning, church. How are you all doing this morning? Good. I'm well. Thank you so much. I have a few announcements to share with you. If you would like to go ahead and open to the bulletin in your app. If you do not yet have our app, it is HCF of Bellflower. And that is where you can get all of this info I'm going to dump on you so that you can remember it later. First up, we are going to be doing a diaper and formula drive again this year. Yes, we did this last year, and we were able to bless hundreds of families, both within our church and within our community, with diapers and formula. So we are going to be doing that again this year. So starting next week, you can bring in baby diapers and infant formula into the sanctuary on Sundays. You can leave it at our side entrance, or we will have a table set up in the foyer by our main entrance. Diapers of any size, and you can just come in and drop them off. A variety of formula, soy-based gosh there's like 18,000 of them guys whatever you find it's all good <laughs> so go ahead and bring in anything you have and we will be doing our giveaway starting on Mother's Day May 12th we will continue to give it out until it's gone um, and that will include our community after our body has taken what they need for their families 
Next up, for those of you who are interested in serving at Vacation Bible School this year, there is a meeting after church today. Yes, you guys are the best. This event is such a blessing to our community and to our church, and it takes a lot of help to do. But the more of you there are, the easier that it is. So again, after church today at 12 p.m., it will be down the street in the student ministry building, and that will, um, VBS this year is from July 13th to 17th. It's a Wednesday to, no, it's a Saturday to a Wednesday. There we go. And that, and that will be um, from 5 to 8.30 p.m. We do an evening VBS. So for those of you who may have worked during the day, feel free to come and help out after work. Whether you're able to help one day or every day, still come to this meeting. Availability can be flexible like that. So if, even if you don't know how much you can participate, we do encourage you to be at the meeting after church today. Next up, there are still a few evangelism outreaches to get involved with this month. There will be skill meetings every Thursday for the remainder of the month at 6.30 p.m. in the Student Ministry Building. This is where you can learn and practice one-to-one -one evangelism. There's also a door-to-door -door tract delivery. Did that already pass? It did. Let me look at my notes, how about that? There is an outreach at Seal Beach Pier at 3 p.m. on the 21st that you can still go to this month, as well as our monthly outreach to the Cerritos Vista Healthcare Center on the 27th at 10 a.m. That is the last Saturday of the month. All right, we are still in need of a safety team volunteer. Did, we did have someone come forward, which is awesome, but we need one more volunteer. So if you could please um, call our church office or email us, you can do that by clicking on the graphic in your bulletin. Um, anytime this week and we'll get in contact with you and let you know what you need to know. Uh, you'll be wearing a vest and it's really to provide a presence in our parking lot and near our children's church entrances and exits, which is really important. Um, so if you're available, we would encourage you to come forward. And lastly, we are reminding you all that we are going to have a family camp this year. I grew up going to family camps. I was a church kid, and they are such a blessing. Even when you're little or you don't like bugs, <laughs> it can be so much fun and a really good bonding opportunity for both the family and the church at large, as, us as a church family. Our family camp is going to be August 2nd through 4th. That's a Friday through Sunday, and we're going to be at Silent Valley Club. Um, this is actually where I grew up doing family camp. This is a really great location. They've got like actual showers and bathrooms and stuff, which is really cool. Um, but you can also do tent camping, but if you have an RV, you can do that. It's really flexible for everybody. There's a lot of stuff for kids to do. There's a rec room, there's a restaurant, there's a kid's pool, an adult pool. It's got everything. Um, so we would encourage you to, to sign up, whatever your camping preferences may be. You can sign up in the app. You just click on the graphic that looks like the one you see on the screen there. The cost is $70 per night per campsite. Um, there is up to eight people allowed per campsite. So we already have a couple uh, Hosanna families that are joining up on one campsite to help lower the altogether cost for their family. So go ahead and start strategizing on what you guys want to do. All payments are due and complete signups are due by the middle of June. So you've got about two months to get all of that figured out and get signed up. With that, let's go ahead and pray and then we'll have Pastor Ethan come back up. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for all of the neat things our body has the opportunity to do to minister to both our church and our community at large. We pray, Lord God, that you would continue to give us wisdom in what the needs of our body and our community are. And we pray, Lord God, for our service today, that you would speak through Pastor Nathan, you would anoint him with wisdom and knowledge, and that his message would be received. And uh, we, we are just so excited to learn about you and who you are and your intent for this world that you created. And uh, we are just excited to learn about you and how mighty you are and to be able to worship you and to serve you. We give this morning to you. We pray that it glorifies you above all else. And we pray, Lord God, that it ministers to the body here in front of me. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Nathan. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 1 today. For those of you who don't know where that's at, it's all the way to the left in your paper Bibles. Or just find it by tapping on your screen, and it's usually the first book of the Bible in the list. 
You know, this book um, is, is just critically important, and it has so many of the foundational truths and the foundations of the truths that we believe as Christians. And so, just as a, a brief overview of the book as we're going to be studying through it, you know, it's divided into a whole lot of neatly structured themes as we go through. We'll point out these different themes, but the two broad divisions in Genesis is typically chapters 1 through 11, and then chapters 12 through 50. And so, Chapters 1 through 11 refer to what um, commentators call primeval history, right? This is uh, way, way back, and in the primeval history as uh, recorded for us in Genesis, we have five major stories that really all have the same exact structure. These stories are the fall of mankind, Cain and Abel. Then we have a story about the sons of God marrying the daughters of men. We have the story of Noah's flood and then the Tower of Babel. And those are the five major stories that make up what the Bible records in primeval history for us. Now, it's interesting is all five of these stories are structured exactly the same way. As we get to them, we'll see that there's a sin described or sin itself is described. Then there's a speech by God pronouncing the penalty for that sin. Then you see God bring grace to the situation and really kind of bringing in grace to ease the misery of what sin is causing, but then you're also going to see that God does indeed punish the sin and brings consequence for sin. Um, this format is kind of what you see throughout the entire Bible, and it really is the format of all history as we're going to see it eventually as we study all the way through Scripture. But what's amazing is throughout Genesis, we're going to see over and over again that when man does his absolute worst and reaches his lowest <laughs> his most depraved, his most sinful, his most wicked, God offers grace. God offers a new beginning. And that's one of the major, major points of this book in who our God is. You know, we see that Adam and Eve sin in the first few chapters of Genesis, and yet there was a penalty for death, that if you eat of that tree, you will surely die. And yet God withheld the death penalty from them for eating of that tree, and then in this, pro, uh, this part of Scripture in Genesis chapter 3, we're going to see the very first prophecy of the coming Messiah. Then we read about Cain killing Abel. And again, Cain was banished from his family, yet we're going to read that he was graced with a mark of protection. And then God gave Seth to continue the godly line. Then the earth becomes violent and wicked, and that's where we read about the flood coming. But again, God preserves the human race very graciously through Noah to carry forth the promise of a Savior for all mankind. Then we get to the Tower of Babel where man in his arrogance thinks, we're going to get up to heaven on our own. We don't need God. We're going to build a tower and we're going to get all the way up there. And then we know in that story that God scatters them by changing and, and, and scattering the languages of all the people so that they couldn't communicate anymore. And in that way, scattering mankind instead of destroying them for their arrogance. Then in chapters 12 through 50 of Genesis, it really focuses on what's called the patriarchal history of mankind. Um, really what we see there, the focus is in the midst of, of polytheistic pagan idolatry. God calls this man Abram, calls him to himself to step out in faith. This man eventually becomes known as Abraham, and he is given a very gracious promise by God where God tells him that through you, all the people of the earth will be blessed. And then ultimately, as Abraham's line goes on, it leads to the creation of the nation of Israel, which ultimately leads all the way down as the genealogy of Jesus Christ and the Messiah who comes to save the whole world. We have the promise of the defeat of the serpent after the fall fully fulfilled, and that is the promise God gives in Genesis chapter 3, that although the serpent will, will strike him, he will crush the serpent's head. And that promise to Abraham then that he would be a blessing to all the nations of the world just unfolds as we go through the book of Genesis through all the patriarchal narratives. And despite the patriarch's repeated errors, repeated sins, repeated falls, we see God's grace and God's promise standing over and over again. Now, you can say then that Genesis really is about grace. This is a book about the grace of God. And really, it's summarized, it is summarized by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Paul said this, but where sin multiplied, grace multiplied even more. 
That's what we see in Genesis. That's a truth that we see the very beginning of in Genesis, and it's a very important truth to all of our lives because we all sin, and we all sin over and over again. But we know that as God's children, His grace multiplies even more in our lives. G. Campbell Morgan, a very famous preacher, um, divided up Genesis this way. He said chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis are generation, right? The, the generation of life in man. And then chapters 3 through 11 are degeneration as man falls. And then you got chapters 12 through 50, which is regeneration, as God then puts his plan to save all mankind into action. And so that little layout there, generation, degeneration, regeneration, again, that's another um, snapshot of the human condition, right? We are born, we are generated, right? And then we're instantly <clears throat> born into sin. It's a nature we have. It's a degenerative condition that plagues all of us. But then we are regenerated, born again, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior. So both the Old Testament and the New Testament affirm um, that Moses was the author of this book, or at least the primary author. Um, it, it affirms that he was the primary author of the first five books of the Bible. You know, there are certain things, like in Deuteronomy, where it records the death of Moses. You know, unless Moses was, was performing some cool tricks, he couldn't really record his, hey, I, I died. So, so we know that there's some contributions by other authors, but the primary writing of these books is Moses. And these five books, these first five books of the Bible is called the Pentateuch. It was the Torah. Or for Jewish people, it was known as the law. This is where they got all the foundation of who God was and what God wanted of his people. Now, in John chapter 5, verses 45 through 47, we see Jesus himself affirming Moses' authorship of these books. As he was talking to the Jewish leaders, he says, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom you have set your hope. Now, again, the hope of the Jewish people, especially the Jewish leaders, was the law, right? They prided themselves on being people who followed the law and, and did everything exactly how God wanted, and the law is everything, and we follow it. And he's saying, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me too, because Moses wrote about me. Which tells us that these first five books that Moses authored, they're about who? Jesus Christ. He said, but if you don't believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe me? And the idea was, is although they were so dogmatic in their claim to follow the law, they were really hypocrites. And we know that through the Gospels, Jesus called them whitewashed tombs, right? You look pretty on the outside, but you're pretty ugly on the inside. And that's really, again, a picture of sin and what it does to our lives. So Genesis, the date of this book, um, is generally tied to the time of Exodus when Israel was wandering in the wilderness. That's when most people believe that this book was written. Um, and, and for those of you that are really interested in time frames, uh, a lot of commentators kind of pinpoint that in the late 15th century B.C. But the idea is that, that as Israel was wandering in the wilderness... The context of their journey surrounding them, right? They, they had been led out of Egypt by Moses. They had crossed the Red Sea, and now they were in the wilderness. And as they were wandering in the wilderness, they were dreaming of the promise, right? They had been promised the promised land, that they were going to be led to this promised land that God had given to them. And, and naturally, you know, this is speculative, but, but if, if you were a group of people wandering through the wilderness... And, and expecting this promise that this man Moses is saying God has given to you, you know, the conversation might naturally come up. Well, who are these people that are our patriarchs that we've talked about so much, that we've believed in? You know, who's, who's Abraham? Who's, who's Isaac? Who's Jacob? Um, you know, the, these are the people that initially brought us to Egypt, right? So what's their story? Where did they come from? And so Genesis is really the story of the origin of, of the people Israel and how they ended up in Egypt. And that's why it's kind of very short. Creation and everything is really an abridged conversation about the, the primeval history, and then the bulk of the book is really about where did Israel come from. And so God met Moses with his word and gave him the book of Genesis. Now, the situational context of Moses' writing helps us frame some of the ideas and the purpose and the point of this book as we study through it. You know, again, Israel's in the wilderness. 
and they had just escaped the, the, the rampant polytheism in Egypt, right? Egypt was a place that, that had pyramid, pyramids and temples and sun gods and moon gods and a god for this and a god of the river, right? It was very polytheistic. And so in Egypt, as the people were there for 400 plus years, they were inundated with this, this pagan religion that stood in direct opposition to their own monotheism. That as a people Israel, they believed in God, the one God. And yet for 400 years as a people, they were inundated with all this pagan, polytheistic religion. And so now Moses is writing to really establish the truth. That instead of a single creator God that they were following, these Egyptians just made up these many gods. These gods that don't exist, that had all these elaborate love affairs and all this weird nonsense and warfare and fighting, but instead, Moses is saying, I'm going to confront all of that stuff you guys have been living in for 400 years and tell you about your God. And more than just where you came from as a nation, Moses goes all the way back as led by the Holy Spirit to talk about where humanity came from as a people that who God is in all of that. And so the opening line of this book would forever establish a true and absolute understanding of who God is, what the universe is, and who we are as humanity. And so in Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now that's as far as we're going to get today. Right? And we could quite literally spend... (laughs) weeks and weeks on this verse, but I've already had the question asked many times, how long are we going to be in Genesis? And so um, I'm going to try and move through Genesis as, as quickly as possible, but I don't want to gloss over the, the core important doctrines of what we learn here. And so um, I know Revelation was long. It might be longer. Who knows? Okay, so, but Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, when you read that, you might ask yourself, the beginning of what? The beginning of what? That phrase, the beginning, is actually one Hebrew word, the beginning. And in the Hebrew, the word is not a time reference. It's an event reference. Do you understand the difference? It's referring to an event, a happening. It's not referencing the beginning as in time as we understand it, but there is a correlation to that. That phrase, the beginning, the Hebrew definition for the word is an event consisting of the start of something. So you could rewrite it and say, at the starting point, God created the heavens and the earth. But that would lead to the same question, right? Starting point of what? Well, it's the starting point of everything. It's the beginning of everything including time as we understand it. It was an event where everything began. The beginning is the event where God literally started the clock of our universe. And then that moment was followed by all of history, past, present, and future yet to be lived. And so, Verse 1 of Genesis is really a summary statement of everything we're going to read about in Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 2, all the way through Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. And then even that section is an abridged creation story. You see, God doesn't give us every single detail of his creation, right? What we don't get into, and I know some people would be like, oh, that would be very interesting. But he's like, he doesn't get into, okay, so I, I took this cork and I took this lepton and I put them together in this way, and I made an atom. And right, he doesn't get into all those details. It just summarizes what God did. In fact, there's only 630 words to describe the origin of everything that exists. Um, Moses will go on to spend far more time in his writing talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And really, the reason why is because Genesis is not meant to be a biology or a cosmology lesson. That's not the focus of this book. Although we're very interested, um, that's not the focus. It's not meant to be a thorough treatise on biology or a thorough treatise on cosmology. And so very briefly, what this book gives us is the origin of all things. And then it moves on to the origin of the Hebrew nation because that's who the Messiah comes through. Now, my point of all that is that there was an event, a moment, when time began. 
time as we understand it, the linear process that we live in. There was a moment when all the forces in our universe began, when all the laws of physics and thermodynamics began. When all the quarks and leptons and neutrinos and protons and neutrons and electrons and atoms, when all of that began, when all the stars and all the planets and all the multiple thousands of galaxies we know that are in our universe began, and at the moment that everything began, this is the important detail of Genesis 1-1, God already was. That's the important detail. In the beginning, God. That's what we learn from this very first important verse. That in the beginning, God. Before time, before creation, before atoms, before mass, before matter and dark matter and all this stuff, God already was. You know, in Psalms 90, verse 2, it says, Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from eternity to eternity... You are God. And there's multiple other verses throughout the Bible that refer to God as everlasting, as the eternal one, right? It says from eternity to eternity, you are God, right? It points in both directions. The same two directions that the word of God starts with and ends with. Eternity past to eternity future. And we have to say it that way because that's how we're created. We understand things linearly. And so we're described, or God is described as existing in that idea of forever past and forever future. Abraham called him the Lord, the everlasting God. <clears throat> in Deuteronomy 33, 27, Habakkuk 1, 12, in Romans 16, 26, God is called the everlasting God or the eternal God. It's all the way through Scripture. It's all the way through Scripture where we're constantly, repeatedly, over and over and over, clued into the fact that God Always was, always is, and always will be. When he said, I am that I am, that was a statement of that I am. When? I am. Yesterday? I am. Tomorrow? I am. Today, right now? I am. That is what this is telling us. Now, you go all the way back to this moment, this beginning, and you might go, Well, how long ago was that, right? People like to debate and talk about such things. How long ago was this moment? Well, depending on who you ask, you're going to get different answers, right? Some people um, uh, ascribe to and believe in what's called the young earth theory, right? That the earth is only between 6,000 to 10,000 years old, or the whole universe is only that old. And uh, that's called the young earth theory, right? That God created everything probably between 6,000 and 10,000 years ago. And there's actually kind of a lot of support for that in in the earth, and we might talk about some of that stuff later. But other people go, no, the universe is 2 billion years old, or 5 billion years old, or 20 billion years old, or however many billions of years we need to get, you know, our evolutionary theories to work, you know. And, um, but regardless, um, there's even believers that that believe the universe is billions of years old, and and they make fairly convincing cases for those types of things. But regardless, the proponents of both sides of this, this question, they argue, and they're very passionate, and they just, they'll, they'll tear into each other vehemently over these things. And my answer to when did the beginning happen um, comes from a question that God asked Job in the book of Job. In Job chapter 38, verse 4, God was responding to Job after Job questioned God's wisdom, Right? This is what God says. Where were you when I established the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. You know what the answer to that question is? Uh, Not there. (laughs) I wasn't there when you established the earth. In fact, nobody was except God because God has existed always. You see the problem? The people that want to argue the, the beginning of everything, it's, it's ultimately all speculative. It's ultimately all speculative, and, and none of the experts were there, right? Nobody was there. And so, yeah, we, we, we speculate. We can draw conclusions. We could, you know, say, well, I think the evidence points here, and that's fine. That, that's really fine, and, and I'm going to deal with some of that, you know, and, as we move forward. But, but 
the idea is this, that, that nobody was there. And so because I'm probably going to get 10 million emails after this study to say, well, where do you lean, Pastor Nathan? Um, I personally lean towards a young earth understanding. That's my personal uh, uh, bent. But again, like much of the things we talked about in Revelation, I don't know. I really don't know. Because when I say, God, when was the beginning? He goes, well, where were you when I established the earth? I'm like, oh, yeah, I wasn't there. I wasn't there. You were there. What we do know, what we do know is in the beginning, God. That's what we know. That's what God has revealed to us. This is how God's word begin, begins. There's no philosophical arguments for the existence of God and, and his nature. It's just simply he was. He existed. He existed prior to everything we know, and that truth is assumed here in verse 1 of Genesis. It's just assumed. Thus, he is the only one who could speak with any real authority about creation because he was the only one there. And so what he tells Moses is simply this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that's exactly the point where a lot of people start with their objections. Before we even get into the rest of it, that's where they start. They go, no, no, I can't accept that. Instead, they want to say, in the beginning, there was gases, and, and, and there was space. And, and, and in the beginning, it just it was all floating around. But the problem is, is if you eliminate God from our understanding of the creation of the universe, you have big problems, big problems. Because if they're going, well, no, in the beginning, there was gas, you go, where did the gas come from? Well, in the beginning, there was just, uh, there was space. Where did the space come from, right? You're just going to indefinitely ask that question, and I don't care how far back in time you go to allow for all these really, really um, interesting theories about stuff. No matter how far back you go, you go you're always going to have the same problem. You're going to have the same problem until you're able to acknowledge that there has to be some first uncaused cause. If you could get to the point of acknowledging that there has to be a first uncaused cause, something caused everything, something began everything, and that something had to exist before, until you could do that, nothing makes sense. But why do so many people try and eliminate God from the equation? Well, Romans chapter 1 answered this very clearly for us. As Paul was writing, he says, mankind did not want to glorify or obey or even acknowledge the existence of God. Even though they could look around in creation, and even though scientists are still going, well, you know, uh, we don't know how that happened. Well, it had to just accidentally evolve. Well, you keep backing up, well, then that, well, then that, well, then that. And and every scientist that, that denies God, they'll get to a place of saying, well, we're not sure. Because everything that they hinge their beliefs on has a cause. And then a cause. And, then God, and the only way you could get to the beginning of this is that there was the first uncaused cause. So, people want to eliminate God from the equation because mankind simply wants its sin. That's what the Bible tells us. In the heart of man, we want sin. We want to live without accountability to anybody. Right? Right? including the, their creator, and so they remove God from the equation. Because if I could remove God from the equation, I'm not accountable to God. And so if I'm just an accident of evolution, then it doesn't care what I do. doesn't care. They, he doesn't care. Nobody cares. It doesn't matter what I do. And so instead they say, well, you know, in the beginning, you know, there was gases floating in space, and then those gases eventually coalesced into a singularity that exploded in a big bang. Instead of in the beginning, God. And personally, I think it takes more faith to believe in all of those theories than it does to believe that there is a God. And so, who is this God we're introduced to here? We already talked about that he's eternal. He has always existed from eternity to eternity. But the word God here is a very interesting word. And some of you have studied this and you know this, but it says in the beginning, God. That word God in the Hebrew is Elohim. It's a Hebrew word that, that is referring to the supernatural being who originated 
the universe and rules over the universe. That's the definition of this word in, in the Hebrew dictionary, right? Elohim. God, Elohim, he is the very subject of the very first sentence in the Bible. And he dominates the entire chapter, first chapter of Genesis. We're going to see that God, this word God in our English Bible, which is Elohim in the Hebrew, um, it, 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 it's 35 times that he appears. Now, what's interesting about this word is it shows us the mystery of the Trinity, the Godhead existing in the beginning. In the very first three Hebrew words of Scripture, we're already told that God is triune. You see, in the Hebrew, in the beginning, God reads this way, Bereshith bara Elohim. Three words. Now, Elohim is a plural word that refers to a singular entity. Can you guys grasp that concept? It's a plural word that refers to a singular entity. So God, plural, is God singular, right? And that's where our brains start to shrivel up. I don't get it. And some people will be like, that because I don't get it, it can't be true. And, and that's just silly. There's so many things we don't get that are true. You know, it's our limited human understanding is not what defines truth. God defines truth. And so we have this word Elohim, this plural word that refers to a singular entity, and that's where we get the idea of the Godhead, the Trinity. Now, it is true that the word Trinity doesn't appear anywhere in Scripture, but the concept, the doctrine is very, very clearly taught. I know people like to argue against it and stuff, and, 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 but I, it's, it's very clearly there if you study the Word of God as a whole. And it starts right here in these first three words of the beginning of the Bible. On one hand, the Bible very clearly demonstrates, and this was a very critical point Moses was trying to make, right, considering they just came out of this polytheistic culture, that there is one and only one God. See, in Deuteronomy 6, 4, part of the Shema, it says, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Very clear. We understand that, that through, through Scripture, it's, it's, it's emphasized over and over that there is one God, and that God is one. But then you also have this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. God speaking says, Let us. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 7, when, when God is going to go um, confuse the languages of all the people at the Tower of Babel, it says, God speaking, Let's go confuse the languages of the people. Now, it is beyond the scope of today's study to exhaustively dig into a biblical defense of the Trinity. And my point was just to establish that it starts in the beginning. But if you do want to dig deeper into the doctrine of the Trinity, I encourage you to go to BibleThinker.org. That's Pastor Mike's channel. And he has plenty of very exhaustive teachings defending the concept of the Trinity in the Bible. But I will point out that this is that when it says in the beginning God, and it's this word Elohim, and it's referring to the God head, the God plural who is one singular being, we do see throughout Scripture that all three members of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, are all involved in creation. And it's really beautiful. You see, in the beginning God, Elohim, that's that word that refers to the Godhead, right? And that involves all three of them, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And then in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it says, The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters of a formless and a dark earth. And there we see the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And then in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we see God theos, the Greek word for God as a whole, with the Son. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was God in the beginning. All things were created through Him. It's referring to the Word that was with God and that was God. And apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. And then verse 14 of John 1, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who's that? Jesus Christ, God the Son, second member of the Godhead. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, Long ago God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times in different ways. In these last days He has spoken to us by His Son, 
God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And so it is, and so it was, that at the beginning of time, and at the beginning of everything that exists in our universe, the one and only God who exists as three distinct, simultaneous, eternal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, who each have their own will, who each speak on their own, they have their own love that they demonstrate, they demonstrate their own individual personhood throughout Scripture, these three who yet exist in absolute perfect harmony consisting of one substance, being co-eternal and co-equal and co-powerful, this God existed and had always existed from eternity past. Outside of time as we understand it, not subject to the physical laws of the universe he created, but outside of all of it. Now, belief in this really, I think, is a doorway to faith, right? It's really the, 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 the key to understanding the Bible. I think everything in the Bible rests on this understanding of Genesis 1-1. If you believe Genesis 1-1, then the rest of the Bible, I think, is easy peasy. I mean, think about it. Jonah getting swallowed by a fish and then spit up on a beach. Well, if you believe in the beginning, God, <laughs> a God who existed into eternity past created everything by speaking it into existence, well then... Jonah getting swallowed by a fish and spit up? Okay, that's easy. Oh, but there's scientifically no way a man could be swallowed by a big fish. God! Omnipotent, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, all power, knowing everything and all things at all times. God. Elijah's floating axe. Simple. Jesus walking on water. Well, he's God. Peter walking on water. Well, yeah, God. Philip. One of my favorite stories in the book of Acts is called down to go preach to the Ethiopian. And as the scripture tells us that after he baptized the Ethiopian, as soon as the Ethiopian came out of the water, Philip was caught up in the spirit. You know what the modern word for that is? Teleportation. Philip teleported. God just went boom, boom, and took him. That's impossible. No, it's not. God. Everything is a no-brainer compared to this glorious, majestic first act of God in creating all things. The first uncaused cause. God was who then created everything. Then the question I kind of want to close today on is, <coughs> well, what was God doing before creation in eternity past? Was he twiddling his thumbs? Was he bored? Like, Man, there's no one to talk to. Well, no, he's a trinity. Also, he was talking to himself. Wait, wait, what was he doing? Was he creating other universes and going, nope, that one's not right. Nope, that one's not right. And then, ah, I got it right. People have all kinds of interesting uh, thoughts and theories on this. Um, and it's all speculative. But the best place to go to find out what God was doing when God was doing what he was doing is to go to his word. And there's one thing in his word that we know for absolute fact that God was doing before creation. And it's really what the entire Bible is about. He was planning our redemption. How do we know this? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says this. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. What that tells us is way back before the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the cosmos, before the foundation of everything that exists, all those atoms and all those planets and all those galaxies in time and, and all these dimensions that physics is, is understanding are out there, before all of it, God, who is all-knowing, knew you. He knew me. He knew he was going to create you. He knew he was going to create me. He knew your name. He knew your personality. He knew your ups and downs. He knew your weaknesses. He knew it all. And he still, before everything existed, said, yeah, I'm going to create him. I'm going to create her. Me knowing my life, whew, God, you still you did that? You Knowing who I was going to be? All those years before I accepted you as my Lord and Savior, all those times I cursed your name, you, you still created me? 
and people ask, well, why did he create us? The Bible tells us pretty clearly that God created us for himself. God created us for his glory and his pleasure. What, th- what that means, uh, Colossians 1.16 says this, all things have been created through him and for him. Now, when I say that God created us for himself, for his glory, for his pleasure, it doesn't mean that, that we were created to entertain him, right? <laughs> Dance, puppet, right? That, that's, that's not what we were created to do. We're, we weren't created to just provide him amusement. But yeah, we do know that throughout Scripture, we see that God is a creative being. It pleases him to create, He's pleased in creation. We see that through the whole Genesis account we're going to study. But God's also a personal being. That's what he reveals to us in his word, and it pleases him to have other beings that he could have a genuine relationship with, a relationship with you that he desires. Now, don't misunderstand. He didn't create us because he needed us, all right? God in eternity lacks nothing, needs nothing, In all of eternity past, there was no loneliness that God had. He wasn't looking for friends. If God never created you and me, he would still be God, fully satisfied and content in his own eternal existence. But the glory of God and God being glorified is manifest in his unconditional lavishing of love on us, his creation. It's just God exercising his glory. It's God loving because he chooses to. Not because he needs to, but because he wants to. Again, he didn't need anything. He didn't have to do anything, but he wanted to love you. And we respond, when we respond to that love, we respond to our creator who created us and say, God, you love me so much, and we put our faith in him and we accept him as our Lord and Savior and we love him back. We praise, we worship him back. Oh my goodness, he is glorified. And so he created the heavens and the earth. He created us to be caretakers of the earth, to live and to exist with him in a perfect, loving fellowship forever. But as we're going to see as we study through Genesis, that sin caused a separation. He created you and me with a free will. Because what kind of love is love that is forced, right? Love isn't love unless it's given freely, willingly. And so he created us to love us and just so that we had the opportunity to love him back. But in order for us to be able to choose to love him back, he had to give us a free will, a will that could say, I don't want to love you. And so he created us that way. And people go, well, why did he do that if he knew we were going to choose sin? Why did he do that? He knew we were going to choose sin. Remember, he's omniscient. Before everything, he knew. But he graciously created Adam and Eve anyways, gave them that free will that they then used to choose sin, which then introduced death and decay and corruption into all of creation. And he knew. He knew that By us making that choice to choose sin, it would separate us from him forever. And despite sin, we see God over and over continuing to show mercy and grace and provision and forbearance. And you just you just read through the Bible and you see all of that. And in God displaying all of those things, God is displaying the fullness of his glory, the fullness of who he is. The Bible tells us God is love. And we see what love looks like and how God responds to mankind. And the ultimate exercise, the ultimate demonstration of his glory was then at the cross, where God the Father poured out his righteous judgment on sin by pouring out all his wrath on God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. And God willingly demonstrated the full glory of his nature, the full glory of his goodness, the full glory of his love by taking the penalty for the sin of all mankind the creator dying for his creation. But just as we exercise our free will to choose sin in the garden through our former parents, Adam and Eve, we have to exercise our free will now in today's world to choose salvation outside of the garden. To say, God, I choose you. I accept you. I believe in what you did for me and I receive that. And when we accept that sacrifice, the Bible tells us that 
The power of sin and death is defeated by what he did. It no longer has control on, on us. When we accept that sacrifice that started in the beginning with God, the plan of redemption that started in the beginning with God, through which he created all things and then created us. And then the enemy entered in and we chose sin. And he said, I have a plan of redemption and I'm going to create a people and there's going to be a nation and it's going to go through history and kingdoms and, and, and it's going to go all the way through to the birth of this Messiah, Jesus Christ, who is God himself, me, coming to the earth to die for you so that I could restore that relationship that you gave up back in the garden. You see, all of the Old Testament pointed toward his death on the cross. It prophesied it. It spoke of it. It lifted up his first coming as, as, as the thing man was looking forward to. And we have to exercise our belief in it. But when we do, then we live lives in the New Testament, which all points towards his second coming. That one day he's going to come back and he's going to take us and paradise is going to be restored and it's going to be wonderful and perfect and everything that God intended in the very, very beginning when he created all things. But it's only through him that that restoration is possible. And when we choose him, again, it greatly pleases him and it glorifies his name once more. Our created purpose to glorify him, to please him, it all comes back, and every time we worship him again and serve him again and choose him again in all ways and all things, we glorify him over and over and over again. And, and in all of that, we, we live and breathe and walk in the ensured promise of eternal life with him in a new heaven and a new earth, and, and it's just going to be wonderful. But this whole deal started. The whole deal was planned here as shown to us in Genesis 1-1 in the beginning, God the first uncaused cause. So that's how the Bible begins. I know we covered a whole half of a verse. That's, I think that's a new record. Um, but do you realize what you'd be able to live through with confidence, with, 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 with just absolute confidence in your life if you believe in the beginning God? Do you realize if you fully, truly believe what this verse teaches us, can you imagine the kind of peace and stability you could have in your life? That if the God you believe in, the God who died for you, the God who loves you, the God who wants to have a relationship with you, the one who created everything, works on your behalf, is there anything you can't go through? Is there anything you can't have victory in? Is there any challenge you can't overcome? The answer is no. We are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Simply because of the belief that he always existed, that he spoke everything into existence, and he knows me. He knows me. You know, in Acts 4, when Peter and John were under pressure from the Jewish leaders and they were arrested and brought in and told not to speak about Jesus, in Acts 4, verse 24, they then went back out to the other believers and they were praying, right? What do we do about this persecution? How are we going to get through this? What it says there in Acts 4, 24, it says, they raised their, raised their voices together to God and said this, Master, you are the one who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. When we start our prayers with that understanding, when we start our prayers with that, that, that concept that, Lord, you existed before everything in the universe existed. God, you created it all, the heavens, the earth, the seas, everything within it. Lord, you created me. If you did that, then you could surely save me. If you did that, of course you could forgive me. If you did that, Lord, of course you could restore my life. If you did that, Lord then I could believe that you hear my prayers and that you're answering my prayers according to your will. And so then, Lord, is your child. Or if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you could start and say, Lord, as your creation, on the basis of your eternal and infinite power, on recognition of who you are, the one who knew me before all of creation, who loved me then, who purposed to die for my sins then 
so that I could be forgiven today, God, be glorified as I accept the salvation you offer me. God, be glorified as I worship you. God, be glorified as I trust you and depend on you for all things, big and small. Because, Lord, in my life, in the beginning, was God. And today in my life is God. And when I leave this earth, it'll be God forever in glory. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. God, we see in your word that you gave us that, that you were there. The Father was there. The Son was there. The Spirit was there. God, that as you reveal yourself in your word, you were there. And God, you reveal yourself through your word because you want us to know you. God, it brings you such glory and such pleasure when, when us, created in your image, Lord, and we're going to get to that and what all that means, Lord, when we recognize you, acknowledge you, accept you, praise, worship you. But God, your glory was even manifest before that. Because God, you made a plan of redemption to save us. Through history, you protected your godly line to fulfill your promise, Lord. Jesus Christ was born God in the flesh. To die for us. And then Jesus, as you went back to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, you told us that you went to prepare a place for us. And so, God, those that know you today, we look forward to that place. But Lord, as you told Thomas, Lord, we are blessed. Those who believe in you without seeing you, we are blessed. And God, we have experienced your presence in our lives. We've experienced your work in our lives. And God, as you call us to believe in you, to believe in the impossible, to pray for the impossible, Lord, that, that relationships would be restored, that addictions would be defeated, that, that God, hopes and dreams would be, would be realized in, in, in according to what you're calling us to do, Lord, that, that everything in our lives that confuses us that worries us, that challenges us, Lord, that we would be able to pray with the full understanding of the truth and the power of who you are. That because, God, in the beginning, you were there. You can accomplish anything in our lives. And so we trust you, God. We wait on you. And Lord, if there's here people here watching online that don't know you, God, I pray, God, just in the quietness of their own heart, they, they call out to you right now. That they would say, Lord, I believe in you. And I believe you existed before everything existed. I believe you were God. You created everything. God, I believe you created me. And Lord, even though I may be struggling with the idea that you knew me by name before anything existed, I'm going to put faith in that and believe that you know me, that you died for me, because you want to forgive me and restore me. And so God, I believe. I put my faith in that. Come into my life and change my heart. And the rest of us, God, that, 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 that know you, we would just pray in, in, the, in the power of who you are. God, we know that you dwell within us. The Holy Spirit dwells within us today, God, as your people. And Lord, if you be for us, who can be against us? God, help us to believe that. Help us to trust that. Help us to walk in that. That we would be effective tools for you in this world. God, be blessed. Be glorified. Be magnified, Lord, with our lives. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship, guys.
You stood before creation Eternity in your hand You spoke the earth into motion My soul now to stand You stood before my failure And carried the cross for my shame My sin weighed upon your shoulders My soul now to stand So what can I say? What could I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So I'll walk upon salvation.
What could I do? What could I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to God, we worship you. We trust in you. Lord, fill us with your spirit as we go from here. Let the love of Jesus shine in our lives. Let the truth of your word pour forth from our lips. Let words of salvation pour forth as well that the people might repent and return to you, our God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. God bless all of you as you serve God this week. Let him be your all and all. If you have any prayer needs or anything uh, like that, that you just really have that burden that you want to come forward There'll be uh, the worship team and other pastors up front to pray with you. Go with the Lord in the Spirit in you. Amen.